and welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this special uh, joint uh, webinar. Um, as you heard, it's a joint webinar between the Nuclear Energy Agency and the Air National Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation. Um, we're here today to talk about nuclear waste. And as people around the world have heard me say on multiple occasions, I started my career in nuclear waste. Um, and I'll probably end my career in nuclear waste because it's been a very, very long journey uh, for everyone who's involved in the subject. But the one thing that I've learned in the many years I've been involved in this issue, uh, both from the technology side, working in industry, working at the Department of Energy, working um, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, working internationally, is that we know what to do with nuclear waste. The nuclear waste is not a challenge that we cannot overcome. We know how to do this scientifically. We know how to do it technically. Uh, politically, sometimes it is a bigger challenge. What you're hearing about today is the fact that not only do we know what to do with nuclear waste today, but we also have great hope for doing more effective ways to imagine nuclear waste in the long-term future, using technology to denature nuclear waste, to reduce toxicity, to reduce heat load, to make it easier to dispose of, and perhaps also to recover some energy value that is left in nuclear waste. The various technology approaches involved in this are, have been examined by a group called the uh, Backend Strategy Expert Group, BEST. And I'm very pleased to be presenting to you, uh, working with you today to talk about the results of this very important study, because this study shows that not only do we know what to do with the waste, but we have these options for the future that we do need to develop. And we do, if we develop these technologies, we should do this together. This tremendous opportunity for international collaboration, both the disposal of nuclear waste from a uh, once through fuel cycle, and also great collaborative, uh, collaborative opportunities if we decide to do some sort of recycling together. One of the key findings of this study is that there is tremendous opportunity to bring countries together to solve these problems, to not just be more cost effective, but really to enhance safety and effectiveness. This is an area that the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation has been involved in almost from the very beginning. They've been looking at the possibility of multinational approaches to disposing of nuclear waste, and you're going to hear about that today. You're also going to hear that while we believe that there's great opportunity in these multinational approaches, that each country ultimately has responsibility to make sure that it has a path forward towards nuclear waste, and we think that's extremely important but it also doesn't mean we can't work together. One multinational approach that you'll hear about today is the European Repository Development Organization, which will show an example of how a multinational approach to the back end can work. We also have the IAEA with us today to talk about the safeguards aspects. And you're going to hear a presentation from Rosatom to get an update of their development of the DGR in Russia. The best expert group is also here to enforce. You're going to hear from its chairman, and you're going to hear from staff. But first, you're going to hear from a most important person, which is the chair of the Air National Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, uh, Alicia Duncan. So I hand the floor to her for her opening remarks. Thank you kindly, Director General Magwood, for that very gracious introduction. Uh, greetings and thank you to everyone who joined this session today. I am Alicia Duncan, the steering group chair of the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, commonly known as IFNEC. And I'm very pleased that we could co-organize today's events with the Nuclear Energy Agency's Back in Strategy Experts Group. I want to thank the Director General for his support of IFNEC and his various roles, which he has described to you already, and capacities over the years. More importantly, I want to express my gratitude to him and Gloria Kwong for con constantly finding interesting synergies for IFNEC to work with the NEA and others on the international stage to discuss important topics like the one we will review today. And finally, I want to thank the organizers of today's session, Hiroki Goto from the NEA and Bill McCahi, Chair of BEST, for bringing together today's distinguished experts to discuss their work. IFNEC is comprised of 65 member countries with diverse views on the deployment of nuclear, ranging from a decision not to pursue a nuclear program to having a robust nuclear program. 
And even with this diversity of thought, all of our member countries subscribe to the mission of in ensuring that the use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes proceeds in a manner that meets the highest standards of safety, security, and nonproliferation. IFNEC is governed by the steering group and has three working groups which collaborate on a variety of issues. They are the Infrastructure Development Working Group, the Reliable Nuclear Fuels Working Group, Fuel Services Working Group, and the Nuclear Supplier and Customer Country Engagement Working Group. Later today, you will hear from Thomas Sagar, who co-chairs the Reliable Nuclear Fuel Services Working Group, and will speak on the great work that they are doing on the back end. So I will leave it to him to present the details. However, I do want to recognize the importance of the discussions and work on the back end, because we know that how we finance and what we do with the used fuel are the two key considerations that countries have to be prepared to answer if they want to compete commercially. The thing that I love about IFNEC is that it provides a forum for countries to have these types of discussions, share ideas, conduct studies, develop best practices and lessons learned, and partner with other experts for such, uh, for such an occasion as this one. We've been able to explore concepts and move from discussions on the what ifs with countries to now working together um, on a dual track approach and consider a multinational repository in addition to a national solution to now having IFNEC partners participate in a full scale analysis with a member country. One thing that struck me in thinking about today's topic is that the back end has really been a part of the narrative of nuclear that has over the years provided some of the anxiety and public opinion around nuclear. The images of the Simpsons and of metal bins oozing toxic substances still pervade the minds of some and public concern for the transportation, storage, and disposal remains a source of concern around the world. And we are all aware of how public perception impacts the political decisions related to storage and disposal. Discussions like the ones we will have today are important because they help to provide an education and normalize the back end as part of the cycle necessary to provide electricity generation, medical, agricultural, and industrial applications needed to sustain us. I look forward to today's discussion and appreciate the contribution of the speakers today and those who took the time to join us for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman Duncan. We appreciate your remarks and very insightful they were. Thank you. So you're going to hear a lot about the best study and the best person to talk about best is the chair, which is Bill McCaughey, uh, who is also a uh, colleague from the US Department of Energy. Uh, who works with us very closely on our, on our Nuclear Development Committee. So Bill, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Director General Magwood. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here to brief you all on uh, the key findings from our expert group on backend strategies. Uh, my name is Bill McCaughey. I work with the US Department of Energy in the Office of Nuclear Energy. My office is uh, responsible for uh, advanced fuels technologies, such as uh, advanced fuels for existing light water reactors, uh, such as accident tolerant fuels, and fuels for advanced reactors, um, such as me metal fuel for sodium cooled fast reactors. Uh, we, uh, my office is also involved in uranium policy in the US, including um, supplying high assay, low enriched uranium for uh, the many advanced reactor concepts that are under development in, uh, in the United States. I've been involved with NEA for about the past five years in the Nuclear Development Committee on the, serving on the Bureau. And uh, part of that time was uh, chairing this, uh, this particular expert group. So if we could move on. Thank you. So this is how I've structured my, my talk here, um, a brief background. Uh, then the, the middle is gonna be going over the steps in how we uh, uh, conducted our analysis and then uh, and how we arrived at our conclusions and recommendations and 
and I'll focus on that at the end. Um, thank you. So our objective was to provide decision makers with an understanding of the nature and magnitude of the differences between the fuel cycle options. So we began our work in 2017. You can see we had a, uh, uh, we were lucky to have such a good team involved in this. Uh, you can see the diverse set of countries. Uh, we all work very well together and uh, everyone contributed to this. I was very uh, uh, lucky and pleased that we, uh, we had this good group and I think the results will, will show. Um, uh, also happy to have Cecile Evans here who's with us. She's the, the, the co-chair of the group with, uh, works with Orano and Hiroyuki Gato who came on um, towards the tail end and shepherded through the report through uh, publication, reviews, concurrences, and also uh, key to organize this webinar. So thank you very much to uh, Hiroyuki. Move on. So here's here are the steps in the analysis. I'm going to be walking through these in the next three or so slides. So um, NEA's objective for this work was at, from the beginning what what they wanted uh, what they thought was necessary is a high level non technical analysis focused on decision makers for making decisions on the back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, also resulting in a relatively brief report, again, non-technical. Um, and so that's, that was what guided us in deciding on how to go about our work. So you can see the first three steps there are uh, kind of go together. The first was we needed to establish the fuel cycle options and define them in a very simple and straightforward way. Then we needed to compare the fuel cycle options and the way we did that was we chose certain characteristics and you'll see those in a minute. To, to do our comparisons, we compared the fuel cycle options. Then um, kind of shifting gears in, in four, so we asked each of the representatives in the expert group to describe the back end strategies for their particular country and also to provide the rationale for, um, for, for how they ended up uh, with the strategies that they're pursuing right now. We identified what we called decision drivers. These are kind of uh, top, important topics that weren't really covered in those first four steps, uh, but, but definitely were topics that are important to uh, making decisions on the back end and then of course, we developed our conclusions and recommendations from, from that. So we can move on. So these are, these are the three fuel cycle options that we settled with. Only three, but we felt like they provide um, enough uh, uh, to, to show the differences uh, and, and to show what are the key aspects of the back end of the fuel cycle, we thought this is the best way to present, uh, to present them. So first column, we have the, what we call the open fuel cycle. This is light water reactors and direct disposal of spent fuel. The second one called mono recycle the key, the key thing here is we introduce reprocessing and we recycle the uranium and plutonium into light water reactors. We're still operating with just light water reactors uh, here. And then with the reprocessing, you dispose of the fission products and minor actinides in deep geologic disposal. And because of limitations in the physics, you, you're only doing this one time. Maybe, maybe a couple more, I'm not, uh, it, it depends, but it's certainly not what comes next or the other fuel cycle. I shouldn't say next because you could, you could kind of settle on any one of these, but next is the multi-recycle. 
The key thing here is you introduce fast reactors and continuous recycle of the uranium and plutonium. So there you have it. That's the three fuel cycle options. Um, uh, added on to the multi-recycle, you see there is there's a possibility for what we call enhanced recycle, which would be to transmute the minor actinides that would have been disposed of, uh, to transmute them in the fast reactors or, or possibly in accelerator-driven systems. Um, so, uh, so there we have the three fuel cycle options. So we can move on to the next. Okay, so now we have to compare them. And this is what we decided to do in, uh, uh, to make the comparisons, kind of a framework for that. We defined certain characteristics that we thought would differentiate the uh, uh, different fuel cycle options and draw out the differences. And we have, uh, we tried to keep this list short. You see, we have, um, we have three types of characteristics. The first column, has to do with the development of that fuel cycle option. What are the challenges, technical, financial, um, uh, it's, it's, and so and so there. Um, the next two columns have to do with, once you have implemented that fuel cycle and it's operating, what are the opportunities that come from that or benefits? And also what are the risks of operating that fuel cycle? And you can see we had five, we kind of grouped five, put five characteristics in each of those categories. And that's how we went about uh, comparing. So you'll see in the report, we have about a page or so on each of these characteristics. We define it. We talk about how each of the fuel cycle options uh, uh, compares uh, with respect to the, that each of those characteristics. Okay, next. Next, now, so that was the three steps. That's, that took a good bit of our effort, our time, and our um, descriptions and analysis in the report. Um, shifting gears a little bit, so we also asked each of the expert group participants to, uh, to write up a brief uh, description of their nuclear energy situation in their country and what their current back end, thinking on back end strat, their back end strategy is. Is it one of those fuel cycle options? Um, where do they stand? A few brief uh, um, uh, descriptions of their framework. Uh, and what we found here was uh, and, and this is what I mentioned early on, is that we were very lucky to have a, a range of countries. So we had Belgium, a small, uh, with a small nuclear program that's phasing out. We have two other countries that have smaller, relatively small nuclear programs that plan on continuing uh, developing more nuclear uh, power reactors. We had two countries with large nuclear programs, but no active reprocessing. And we have uh, large, large uh, countries with large programs and active reprocessing. And uh, um, the other thing I wanted to make uh, clear here, when, we, when you read through the descriptions, and we had a lot of discussions about this as well, is that countries make their decision based on history. This is the history of their nuclear power development programs and, 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 the, and what, they, what they prioritize, what they value, and what they're, it's, it's really, a, uh, it could be a philosophy, uh, could be the way, you know, it's, it's their values, their way of developing their nuclear power programs. Um, next. So these are what we had called uh, again. This is another. Um, uh, this is this is another uh, a part of our discussion. So it ended up being part of our analysis and part of our report. 
we call them decision drivers, other decision drivers. What these were were topics that kept coming up again and again in our discussions. Uh, they didn't fit the, the steps going in that, that I described earlier, but um, each of these is important topic for decision makers. And it's important to, it was important for us to describe these topics in, uh, in the report. So you can see these were, uh, so each of these is a section in the report uh, pointing out the need for the back end strategies. What are the impacts of extended storage of spent nuclear fuel? How do the country char characteristics of the different countries come into play in their decision making on the back end strategies? And then, of course, there was a discussion of uh, the, um, the 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 pros the 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 importance of a shared uh, of pursuing a shared infrastructure and international collabor collaboration on the back end. This is both both in, in infrastructure and facilities and also in technology development. Okay. So that brings me to our conclusions. So first off, we felt like once we got through all of this, we really, we, we felt that these three fuel cycle options is a, was a good way to organize the uh, analysis um, and cover the important differences among um, backend strategies. Uh, secondly, when you look at the, uh, what we call these uh, discriminating, uh, these characteristics, these differentiating characteristics, quite a few of them are really all shared by all of the fuel cycle options in a very, in a, to, to, like I said, to a similar degree here. Um, for example, deep geologic disposal. Every fuel cycle option requires deep geologic disposal, either for the spent nuclear fuel directly or for fission products and minor actinides from reprocessing. You can't get away from that. Then uh, others, other of these were, um, we really couldn't discern a major difference between the fuel cycle options for things like financial challenges in the development, uh, social acceptance. Also these, uh, uh, once operating, there are certain risks and we've, uh, such as proliferation security, worker safety, public and environmental health. And we felt like that's really not a discriminator among these fuel cycle options. All of these fuel cycle options can be developed and manage risks in an acceptable way. And in fact, we have. Uh, we have in, in all of these cases, we have nuclear power plants, we have reprocessing, we have, um, we even have Fast, uh, we, we have fast reactors that have been built and operated uh, for uh, under, uh, and, and all of them have uh, controls, regulations in place and, and, and we manage risks. Now there are some, there are some of these uh, characteristics where you do see significant differences and they're listed they're listed here. Very you know, significant differences in material flows, what goes in and what comes out for disposal. Um, big differences between the, um, the open cycle and the, uh, continuous, the continuous recycle both in, uh, you know, in, in types of material, characteristics of that material that requires disposal. And then we felt like uh, the, one of the others that uh, we felt needed, uh, that we wanted to draw attention to is that uh, for multi-recycle, there are many technical challenges uh, to get the, to, to the fast reactors 
on a commercial scale and also for um for especially for the enhanced recycle for separating minor actinides we have um we have much more challenge there for technology development next so rounding out our conclusions and recommendations uh the next so all countries need to be actively implementing a strategy uh this is uh we started with the european union requirements uh for uh developing a strategy and then reporting on it periodically also the iaea convention also requires all countries to have a strategy um, for the back end now that strategy could take on many different forms it could it could be one or more or a combination of these fuel cycle options over time, but there needs to be a strategy uh, or else there could be, you know, it could cause uh, harm to the nuclear energy programs in these countries if you really can't articulate a strategy for what you're gonna do with the back end. Another is that all countries need to invest in knowledge management. Um, these efforts take time sometimes that you with tech with new technologies uh, uh or changing administrations one aspect may be favored over another but over time if you don't keep up with your r d infrastructure and your technical expertise you are going to be precluding certain strategies just by through attrition and then finally we have two recommendations that relate to international collaborations. The first has to do with um, there are there is a lot of uh, uh, potential benefit to the multi-recycle option and, and enhanced recycling efforts, but there's much to be done in technology development. And this is an area where um, we could really benefit from strong international collaborations to bring all countries together to, to work on these uh, uh, to work on these issues together. And then finally, and this is um, this is where IFNET comes in, that uh, we really should be accelerating the collaborations on uh, and in facilitating the shared infrastructure and spent fuel management. And uh, this will benefit most countries out there who have uh, smaller, medium-sized, either medium-sized, small-sized nuclear power programs or have limitations in their resources, natural resources, uh, financial resources, to go it alone. So um, that is, uh, that concludes what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to discuss here on our, on our report. Uh, thanks for your attention. And um, let me turn it back over to Hiroki. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. McCoy, uh, for sharing the outcomes from the expert group activities. So today, we will have three more presentations, which are selected by IFNEC to discuss the multinational approach to backend strategies and geologic repositories. Uh, these presentations will be provided by Mr. Ewald Verhoff from Erdo, uh, Mr. Jeremy Wittrock from IAEA, and Mr. Uzwald Igin from Norano, Norao, Russia. So each presenter will introduce themselves before they begin their presentations. So let me proceed to the next speaker. Mr. Verhoff, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Hiroyoki. Uh, so my name is uh, Ewald Verhoff and I'm the Deputy Director of COFRA, which is the organization in the Netherlands that's responsible for the management of all the radioactive waste, including the implementation of a geological disposal facility in the future. And as such, I'm responsible for the research program on disposal in the Netherlands. I also have the honor of chairing the ERDO 
the Erdo Association for Multinational Radioactive Waste Management Solutions. Uh, and it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here uh, uh, today and to speak about Erdo um, and to summarize about 20 years uh, of experience uh, on the multinational approach to the back end strategy uh, in about 10 minutes. Um, our experience is that the development of shared solutions uh, um, to disposal is best taken in uh, small steps and must be based on mutual trust. Um, multinational repositories uh, as an option to the back end uh, strategy uh, uh, are recognized by, in particular, the IAEA and the European Commission and an increasing number of national programs. Uh, about half of the EU member states consider multinational repositories in their national program. The reason for that is that all European member states produce long-lived radioactive waste for which they need a disposal option. And in some European countries, it's difficult or nearly impossible to um, develop purely national solutions for the management of their radioactive waste due to a lack of financial and technical resources, research capacity, or even suitable geological formations. Uh, and others may be interested in multinational repositories because of economic optimization. And there's need, therefore, for the development of shared solutions for disposal. An important milestone in the thinking in Europe about shared solution was the SAPIR-1 project, which was sponsored by the Euro European Commission and run from 2003 up to 2005. And it looked or it, it investigated the basic feasibility of uh, shared disposal options. Its conclusions were that the potential advantages of such shared facilities are widely acknowledged in the European Union, if only demonstrated by the large number of countries involved in the project, and that the clearest advantages to having a facility shared by, with countries are in the field of economy. Most of the problems of a shared facility are that of uh, are comparable to that of a national facility. Um, and if we want to develop a shared facility, we should increase effort and in particular to develop a practical implementation strategy for such facility. And that was the topic of the Sapir 2 project, also financed by the EC and run from 2006 to 2009. And it concluded uh, that uh, multinational solutions, multinational repositories are an organizational issue, a political issue rather than a technical option. And it recommended that we move forward in an adaptive staged manner, as you can see in this figure. And the first step was to establish an ad hoc working group of interested countries um, to do the groundwork, to agree on an organizational framework, on project plans, and to allocate funds um, for the disposal facility. And the working group did just that. It produced two milestone reports uh, um, that presented a roadmap to a multinational repository and starting models for the structure, the program, and the financing, and distributed these documents to the relevant decision makers uh, in member states of the European Union. Uh, but it became clear that moving from the working group to an implementation organization, which was considered the next step, was a too big hurdle to take. And, um, it was uh, clear that potential Erdo partners should first get to know one another, trust one another, and develop uh, a common need, uh, a need for a common need for a multinational uh, repository, uh, in particular by developing joint projects. 
So the mission of the Erdo Working Group evolved beyond the eventual goal of a shared, shared multinational repository to include activities in the predisposal phase that could benefit from sharing, sharing knowledge, technology, and facilities, and by doing that, building trust among the interested countries. The Erdo Working Group uh, ran from 2009 to 2020 and was comprised of 11 organizations nominated by the appropriate government level organizations, uh, reflecting that uh, the Working Group looks at practical, strategical and policy issues rather than at tactical issues. And it was self-funded by these organizations. The Working Group met twice a year to cooperate uh, and exchange knowledge between the members. It organized symposia, workshops, meetings with the EC, and uh, members participated in projects. The problem was that the working group could not finance projects represented members uh, in meetings with the EC or in international projects. And, Therefore, it was decided to transform this working group into a formal association. And the reason for that is that an association is a legal form and can therefore represent its members in official forums. It can participate in international programs, launch joint projects, enter into contracts and hire consultants work as a knowledge center on shared disposal and act as a spokesman for multinational solutions. And as Erdo is primarily composed of smaller nuclear programs, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, synergy between the programs is important and that's, that's better uh, uh, carried out in a legal entity than in a more loosely uh, working group. So I'm very pleased to, to say that uh, this January, uh, three founding members have signed the Articles of Association, COFRA from the Netherlands, DECOM from uh, Norway, uh, DECOM from uh, Denmark and NND from Norway and established this new association. And the other working group members have started to join the association. And we received also uh, uh, quite a lot of interest from other organization in the new association. The mission of the association is to work together and address the common challenges of managing our long-lived waste in our countries. And our aim is to establish uh, one or more operational shared multinational uh, waste repositories uh, as a complement, not in competition, uh, to uh, um, other national programs. And the association is open to the membership of any other organization that supports the aim of the association. Current members uh, uh, of the working group and the association are waste management organization, regulators slash ministries, research entities. And we of course also welcome international organizations. So the lessons that we took from the Erdo approach uh, over the past uh, almost 20 years is that developing shared solutions uh, is best done in taking small steps and should be based on mutual trust and um, support from international organizations such as the IAEA, the European Commission and the OECD NIA can strongly help the development uh, of multi uh, multinational initiatives as we have seen in Erdo. And for those of you that's interested to see uh, more about Erdo, um, I can announce that we're planning for a full Erdo webinar on the roadmap to multinational repositories later this year. And with that advertisement, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Verhoff, for providing uh, Erdo's considerations and activities about the multinational approach to the back end. So let me give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Whitrock. I'll hand it over to you. Good morning. Can you see my screen? Yes, sure. Thank yeah, you. Okay. 
Uh, good morning, everybody, or uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Whitlock. I am the section head of uh, concepts and approaches in the Department of Safeguards at the IAEA in, in Vienna. And I'm pleased to share with you today some high level thoughts about a related topic to what we're talking about today, uh, geologic repository safeguards. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased um, to be invited to present this topic today because as you will see in my presentation, it's very important that uh, people who are planning repositories appreciate the fact that in fact, safeguards will be applied to this end of, to, of, of the fuel cycle. So uh, as I mentioned, they're high level thoughts. So we'll, we'll drill down from the purpose of safeguards in the, in the first place. What we're talking about with safeguards is the obligation that, that most countries on the planet have made when they signed the non-proliferation treaty. So they have made this obligation to only use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Well, how do you verify that to your neighbor countries on the planet? Well, you get the, the IAEA to verify. So we provide the credible insurance to the global community that all nuclear material, and I underscore the word all, in a state is being used only for peaceful purposes. And thus the state is honoring its uh, its obligations under the treaty. And so the asterisk here is to tell you that I'm talking about states that have signed a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the IAEA, which are most states on the, on the planet, uh, not the nuclear weapon states um, in particular. So again, talking about states that have signed a comprehensive safeguards agreement, we talk about three generic objectives of safeguards. And all of these are relevant to the back end of the fuel cycle. The, the first one is to detect diversion of declared nuclear material in the state. The second is to detect misuse of your nuclear facilities, nuclear material, or another way of saying that is undeclared production or processing using nuclear material or nuclear facilities. And the third one is to detect everything else in the state that might be going into a, a nuclear weapons program. So you've got your, your declared facilities and the first two objectives. And the third one is what was introduced after the Iraq experience in the mid nineties, in the early nineties to, um, you ought to be looking elsewhere in the state and not just at the declared nuclear fuel cycle. So as I mentioned, these are all relevant to the safeguards considerations for geologic repositories. And I stress that we are not saying that we suspect that anyone building a repository is proliferating. Our job is to verify on behalf of that state that is building a repository that they're meeting their objectives. They're the ones that have made the declaration. So uh, this is a representation of the nuclear fuel cycle just to show what parts of it are generally under safeguards. Uh, in uh, uh, under comprehensive safeguards uh, in those states. So if you look at the, the fuel cycle, most of it is under a material accountancy. So we are counting the uranium and plutonium atoms in everything from somewhere through the uranium production process right to the very end when the uranium and plutonium is put underground and everything in, in between. So this includes R&D activities where nuclear material is involved, um, not just nuclear uh, sort of nuclear fuel cycle facilities, but locations outside facilities or, or LOFs or LOFs as we call them here at the agency. And those are facilities that have nuclear material, but uh, not necessarily a, a nuclear uh, facility. And within this red dotted line, we are counting all the dotted, all the uranium and plutonium atoms, but then when things are um, moved outside because of decommissioning or waste, um, not geologic repositories for a reason I'll get to in, in a minute, we can still account for those through what's called an additional protocol in states that have signed and ratified. And under much discussion lately with Iran, for example. So here we can go and, and visit the mines and the um, the upstream uranium processing facilities. We can, we can go look at the decommissioned facilities, the waste sites that we have access to um, to check on. Uh, R&D facilities that have no nuclear material but have some relevance to nuclear fuel cycle uh, manufacturing capability. Um, so that is expanded and enhanced uh, uh, IAEA safeguards since the early 1990s, takes, takes this form. For countries that have signed 
a comprehensive safeguards agreement, and then the accompanying additional protocol, which is the part in green. So we implement what's called state level safeguards. State level safeguards is a relatively new term, but it's an old concept. It's as old as the IAEA itself and its safeguards regime in that the original safeguards uh, agreement starting the comprehensive safeguards agreements um, specified that we are to, to be monitoring, verifying the peaceful use of all nuclear material and facilities in, in the state. So the fact that we would only for a couple of decades be looking at uh, the declared facilities is, is irrelevant. The overall goal was always, the overall mandate was always um, state level safeguards. So more so since the early 90s and today we are implementing this by, by in having st strengthened measures. We look at an individual state's technical capabilities and available nuclear material, uh, not just where the state has said that they have facilities, but what, what material is in the state, underground or above ground, and what are its industrial capabilities, not just nuclear fuel cycle capabilities. And then we construct what we call acquisition paths, which is if, if we were them, how would we use this material to make weapons, to convert it to weapons usable form, which would be metallic HEU or metallic plutonium. Um, so we construct these acquisition paths made up of s separate acquisition steps, starting with the, the introduction of the nuclear material and ending with the weapons usable material at the end. These are customized paths for each state and the state level safeguards uh, approaches that are developed from these are also customized uh, as opposed to today or formally, I should say, where the safeguards applications were, were more uh, cookie cutter based on the facilities themselves. So if you have an LWR or a fuel fab facility, you pull out the LWR safeguards approach and with some modifications, you then apply that. We now look at the, we still focus on the facility, but in the context of the entire state. The purpose of this all is to have a non-discriminatory and consistent approach across all the states. Okay, so for geologic repositories, there are a number of, of challenges that we consider when applying safeguards. Um, okay, so full disclosure, we haven't yet. We are in the process of developing safeguards approaches for the, the first operational geologic repository in, in Finland. And they are the guinea pig in, in that respect, but there are many, many geologic repositories that are being planned uh, under design or are under construction. So. Uh, much like SMRs at the at the front end of the fuel cycle, um, we we need to come up with uh, a strategy for Im uh, implementing safeguards. The sheer quantity of nuclear material is huge that will be stored uh, in the repository. The, the size of the containment, and in this case, what does containment mean? Well, it's the geologic containment, if you will, ar around this large quantity of material. So so. So thousands and thousands and thousands of potential critical masses of uranium and, and plutonium um, can be derived from, from the material that's uh, that's in the repository. And that brings me to the third bullet on this slide, which is that all of this material uh, will be under safeguards. The plutonium and the uranium will, be under, will need to be put under safeguards. Why? Well, because yes, it's hard to get at. It's intentionally hard to get at for safety reasons. Um, but it's not impossible to get at. And therein lies the rub that safeguards has a, a, a more stringent requirement, a more stringent requirement than safety on nuclear material uh, in that we have no free release limits. Uh, if, it's, if it's technically practicably uh, um, uh, accessible by the state within reason, um, then it's, it needs to be under safeguards. So. That said, the underground conditions are extremely harsh uh, for both inspectors, humans and, and instruments. So it's no place to be, to be placing or either on a routine basis. And uh, practically speaking, re-verification of the spent fuel is, is, uh, is impossible. So if something goes wrong, if you, if you can imagine that you have instruments that are telling you what's happening underground and, and something goes wrong with them, there is no way to re-verify this, this nuclear material. So the safeguards need to account for that. How do we do that? Well, first of all, obviously it's on a case by case basis, depending on the host state's capabilities. That's a, a statement of state level safeguards in itself. 
an interesting point is that the time scale of the repository will exceed that of the nuclear fuel cycle. And when we are looking at the acquisition paths that I mentioned before, one thing we're asking ourselves is how long does it take to progress through the fuel, through these acquisition paths, through each of these steps? Um, well, the repository is a million years and, and longer, so it's 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 off the charts, and we won't be around, um, but someone will be safeguarding it. But when we're thinking about state state specific factors, we need to take that into account. That institutions that we're looking at today will not will not be in place. Likely, will this facility still will be? Um, so therefore, the, the measures need to be adaptable. I would say simple and and robust. Um, there's two phases, by the way. There's the emplacement of the fuel, and then there's after closure. Um, safeguards by design will be key. It's it's always a best practice to have safeguards by design. This means thinking about safeguards. It means doing exactly what we're doing today, talking about safeguards, and when you wouldn't have normally thought that it was relevant, but in the context of of any aspect of the nuclear fuel cycle and at any stage of design of change or or new as new components for the fuel cycle. Uh, very important at the upstream with new SMRs and extremely important at the back end as well for the same reason because it's new it's new and challenging. Um, Non-invasive containment monitoring will be needed because we are not going to have access to this material. So it's it's much like how do you put safeguards on a, on dry storage? Um, you don't do it by trying to get into the dry storage itself. You do it from the outside. Uh, this is the same thing only um, you know, several kilometers uh, wider, taller, longer. Okay, a couple slides now on what kind of safeguards measures would be applied to to geologic repositories. So these are the measures the agency would would then implement at the site. And safeguards by design means understanding this when the repository is being designed in the first place and talking with the agency and actually having the IAA as a partner in, in the design process. So continuity of knowledge, as we call it, um, of the spent fuel must be maintained from the last point that it's verified, which is probably when it's placed inside the emplacement container, uh, and then when to when it's in, into the repository. When it goes into the repository, we, we want to know that it stays there. Um, it will be classified as what we call difficult to access, which means exactly what it what it sounds like, and that requires that additional uh, measures are are taken for of, for verification before you last uh, before you don't have any eyes on it in any, uh, in, the, in the future. Um, this leads to reduced requirements for re-verification, which is a necessity, and at the same time there is an ongoing verification of containment as a condition of that. So you obviously go on checking that. In, in terms of the repository, that forever more, as long as there is an IAEA, we're checking that the host state. So in the context of a multinational situation, it's the it doesn't matter. It's the wherever the host state is, um, is is you know there, there's no undeclared uh, tunneling going on um, the, where you might be coming in from the from the side to get the fuel out, and this is completely. Um, regardless of the technical merit of doing that, because we often get asked that question, like who in their right mind would try, would, would bother to go down a kilometer or half a kilometer and get this material out under those harsh conditions you've just described? Um, the fact is it can be done. If it can be put there, it can, it can be taken out. And we're not talking about milligrams of, of nuclear material here. We're talking about thousands and thousands of what we call significant quantities, which are roughly like critical masses. Um, during emplacement of the spent fuel, uh, there will be design verification of the repository itself. There will be on-site surveillance, uh, so cameras and, and, and uh, instruments. There will be remote monitoring, so monitoring from Vienna, um, unannounced inspections in response to uh, information gained from the, from the state about what's going on with, with the construction, if it's the construction period or the emplacement, and the additional protocol measures which allow us to to go elsewhere and have additional activities, which I mentioned before, that, that larger green envelope that I drew on the previous screen, if that's in place for the for the country we're talking about. Uh, ongoing verification of containment, which I mentioned is a, is a condition of uh, the difficult to access. Difficult to access allows you to back off on some of the requirements, but you need to verify, you need to continue some things, and this is one of them. So continuing to monitor the declared access points to the underground, the declared access points, so e e ventilation shafts, um, machine shafts, person shafts, any anywhere that you can get material out. Um, 
state-of-the-art technologies may be considered in cooperation with the state, and these will, will evolve during the 100 years of the emplacement. So this technology will, will evolve itself as, long, uh, uh, as well as the project will during the century that is being uh, implemented, and safeguards by design is essential. So I'll close with the IAEA's commitment. To, we will we do support the safe, secure, and peaceful use of nuclear science and technology from cradle to grave. We're a pro-science, pro-nuclear organization. We're talking about the grave today, obviously. And my final slide, since we're a technical organization, is to leave you with my thank you written as, as scientifically as I can get. This is Fukushima, another type of grave in the nuclear world. Um, some IEA inspectors, and uh, I, I, I thank you with those elements at the top of the screen. So thank you very much, Mr. Whitlock, for sharing the uh, IAEA's insight for the safeguard issues associated with back-end of fuel cycle. So now we will go on to the last speaker. Uh, Mr. Again, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, this presentation has already been delivered at the EHA-URF meeting today, so I <laughs> uh, already talked to this meant for it. So um, I would like to make a special comment because of the distinguished presenter from the uh, EAA uh, regarding the SAGAS issue. Uh, speaking about their uh, Russian program, it's uh, definitely worth mentioning that we're supposed to dispose red waste only, but not spread fuel. So uh, basically, uh, SAGAS is so, uh, slightly not that important for us than for many other uh, countries. Uh, due to the subject as well as not going to uh, dispose fissile material. So, um, okay, um, now I'll go on with my presentation. So on this uh, map, uh, you can see the proposed plans for disposal of high-level waste or classes one and two in the Russian classification. So on this map of Russia, uh, you can uh, see uh, the main producers of uh, red waste, which are nuclear power plants, obviously. And here with narrow, you can see uh, the site, which is <clears throat> called the Nishnikansk Rock Massive, which we uh, propose to be uh, the site for our uh, deep geological uh, repository and where we are currently construction the underground research laboratory. You can see uh, the latest scheme of this uh, lab in the right corner of the screen. Uh, just a short information on the feasibility study to choose uh, uh, the proper size. We started the size selection process uh, in the 1970s. We can see different uh, uh, areas, even remote ones like uh, Nova Zemlya, which is really, or Kovat Peninsula, which is really at the far north or the far east of Russia. Uh, we also considered clay, you can see here at the Kalmykia, which is in the south of Russia. Unfortunately, we haven't received uh, public support for this uh, particular site. So uh, after certain investigations, uh, well, in the 90s, we came uh, across uh, the uh, Nizhnikansk Rock Massive, which is not far from the city of uh, Krasnoyarsk, uh, East Siberia, Krasnoyarsk region. So uh, at this Yeniseisky, we've considered several sites as well, apart from it. Um, investigations took place uh, almost uh, 20 years, and the result, the Yeniseisky site, has been uh, chosen for a more thorough investigation. Uh, on this picture, I can see that we also located uh, several uh, sites in this uh, Nizhny Kansk area, and investigations also took some uh, time. So uh, finally, when the site had been selected, uh, we decided to proceed with the uh, URL. On this picture, uh, you can uh, see the time charts of the Russian the DGR uh, program. So um, the development of, of the design of DGR and then the URL uh, took us, uh, well, almost 10 years. Uh, so uh, the strategic master plan for research and uh, development had been also developed uh, five years ago. And in 2017, the pre-construction uh, phase of the URL has started. So uh, currently, uh, we're at the construction stage for the URL. Uh, we have finalized uh, the on-ground energy complex 
uh, we're almost done with the water supply of the objects and uh, hopefully by the end of the year we're done with the on-ground part and next year we will go underground. So uh, as for the time schedule, uh, we're supposed to uh, finalize the construction of the Euro by 2026. Uh, the experiments will take approximately five years and in well, 2031 from now, uh, we'll make a decision if the repository will be constructed. Uh, we plan to construct it also for five years and after it operate the first unit for almost uh, 30 years. So um, here's a brief information on the uh, URL. So on the left, you see the plan of ground facilities. On the right, again, the scheme of the URL. Uh, here you can see where it's tourists are located in the map of Russia and some brief information the URL. So we have three vertical shots, depth of uh, 500 meters with the diameter of um, 6 to 6.5 meters. Uh, there will be horizontal capital mining galleries at a depth of 450 meters to 525 meters. And the total length of, of the object will be more than five kilometers. So uh, here you can see the information on the repository system on the rock myself where we are supposed to build the uh, URL. Uh, so this is hard rock, uh, more than 80% of this is nice and 20% of dolerite. So it's pretty hard rock. So what's the key objective of our uh, URL? First of all, to research the house rock, the repository system, to identify its characteristics, to confirm uh, the safety case of this natural barrier. Uh, so the second point is to uh, research and justify the isolated properties of engineering barriers, to test technical solutions, different technical solutions for transportation, uh, controlling handling, etc. Uh, train our staff and finally demonstrate the safety case uh, both to the regulator, to um, expert community, and to the general public. Uh, we assume it will be three possible scenarios after the research are done in the uh, URL. So the first one is the optimistic scenario that the safety case will be proved. And then we can uh, proceed with the construction of the uh, DGR. The second is going to be neutral scenario that um, we haven't uh, proved like 100% the safety case and the engineer barriers in particular and the design, their composition will uh, require certain amendments. Uh, so we'll have to reconsider the design probably, but still we consider the size. And the further pessimistic scenario, we'll consider that, well, um, this particular site is not suitable for high level waste in our classification. And you'll we'll probably have to give the, the whole project, which is the worst case scenario, or we'll change type of the waste which we'll dispose in this facility. Um, just a brief conclusion that we already have the developed strategic master plan for our research, which includes more than 150 researchers. Uh, there will be a special uh, demonstration uh, center. Uh, this will help us to make a comprehensive research of the repository system, engineer uh, barriers uh, to prove uh, different operations. And uh, finally, uh, we'll hope we hope that we'll be able to prove the safety case and construct a uh, deep geological repository for high level waste. So uh, that's all for today. If you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask them. Yes, today uh, we will have uh, five, no, six experts for the panel discussion. And uh, which we, uh, the panel discussion will be moderated by Mr. Makohi. So, Mr. Makohi, are you ready? So, uh, can I pass the floor to you? Certainly, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so the way our panel discussion is arranged, we have, uh, we have uh, four panelists who will give a brief um, presentation of their own, about five minutes each. 
and then we open it up for uh, th then we'll open it up for questions and comments uh, for the rest of the session. So um, we'll start with uh, Tomas Zager from uh, IFNEC, and then we'll follow uh, Tomas with uh, with three members of the back end strategies expert group: Cecile Evans, Sophie Pido, and and Brent Dixon. So let's begin with uh, Tomas, if you're ready, please uh, please go ahead with your opening remarks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> since we already have two members of our working group with slides, I will just uh, say a few words. So first, I would like to thank Mr. Ferruf for his presentation on the work of Erdo in fostering cooperation on the potential development of regional repository Erdo is a really unique and valuable organization making important contributions to the idea of shared solution to the disposal. And not just in Europe uh, where the Erdo is based, but also as an example for other regions around the world. So, and also I would like to thank to Mr. Whitlock and the IAEA. IAEA is a member of our working group and we can always count on IAEA for support and participation. So just to go a little bit back with our working group, we have been over the past eight years in the working group in the IFNEC uh, working and addressing numerous topics related to the back end of the fuel cycle. These topics have focused on opportunities to foster international cooperation toward shared solutions, in particular approaches to developing multinational repositories, or with other words, multinational disposal facilities. Today, more than 50 countries have their use or spent nuclear fuel from commercial nuclear power plants stored in different storage facilities at several sites. Of course, globally, this storage is well managed with proven technologies and strong safety record. However, regard, regardless of the fuel cycle used in each country, as we know, and we have already heard today in the past report, all backend strategies will require geologic disposal as a final step. So, as we know, and we have had several workshops and uh, documents produced on this, multinational geological repository is an interesting option for reducing overall costs for disposal and providing countries with small spent fuel inventories with an option for addressing disposal challenge. Our working group activities on the concept of cooperation in the development of multinational repositories have been directed at removing obstacles and opening platform for discussion and promoting the multinational repository concept. Uh, the activities have included workshops and conferences on financing, industry participation, approaches to organizing a multinational repository effort, and promoting the adoption of the dual track approach. Dual track approach is a relevant and important political approach, approach to strategy uh, in which you at the same time look at national and international options and taking full responsibility nationally. So this option is available to countries that wish to pursue a policy of keeping the options, uh, both options open. This dual track approach can be followed until either a national or multinational solution has been implemented. And I'm happy to say that several countries have already implemented this policy and the number of countries with dual track policy is steadily increasing. Uh, and we are happy to provide with support and some policy guiding in this respect. In the process of removing obstacles and opening platforms for discussions, the working group involved and worked with relevant parties and organizations around the globe, with IEA, OECD, Euroatom, also industry and World Nuclear Association, Erdogan especially, and of course, several interested countries in, from the six different continents, in fact. So the working group recognizes that building the national geological disposal facility is a very difficult challenge, and some countries may not have the right geology. So for some countries, it might be a little bit too challenging, also from financial point of aspect, or from the human resource aspects of view. But for some, with both new and existing small nuclear programs, the cost of a geologic disposal facility are also prohibitive. The high fixed costs on the other side and the size of needed human resource are largely independent from the size of repository. These high fixed costs results also that for repositories, economy of scale is significant and the economy of scale, of course, favors large repositories. 
Uh, and this, uh, of course, may one big advantage of why international or multinational repositories are uh, an interesting option. Further, a shared repository may also lead to the potential enhancement of global nuclear safety and security, both technically and economically, and the potential benefits of cooperation in the development of multinational disposal facilities are broadly recognized. Unfortunately, there is a long history of initiatives to develop shared disposal facilities with no clear final success yet. These initiatives have all failed mainly for political reasons, while in some cases due to undeveloped technical solutions also, but mainly I say from political reasons. The good news is that over the past decade, there has been an increasing interest in the concept of multinational and regional disposal led in significant part by our work and by much of <clears throat> other groups also working. And we must credit here, of course, ERDO and its precursor, the working group of ERDO and the SAPIR and ARIUS projects. And of course, also IAEA. IAEA has developed uh, several reports addressing the multinational repository concept in the past years. Nonetheless, the issue of country agreeing to import radioactive waste remains very sensitive from public and political perspective. And it's even forbidden by law in several countries. This leads back to the discussions in the BEST report. The report not only contributes to clarifying and distinguishing between the three basic backend strategies, but also recognizes an important element of each strategy, its reliance on multinational cooperation to succeed. Interestingly, the importance of cooperation applies to development of backend strategies for both large and small nuclear programs. This cooperation in evaluating, making policy decisions, and implementing backend strategy must continue to grow. Most important, it is that the value of this cooperation is fully recognized and strongly supported at the national leadership levels. And we hope that the best report will communicate this well to the political and national leaders. We should make a special effort to continue to emphasize the need to openly to open additional avenues and additional opportunities of international cooperation to advance the implementation of backend strategies. In closing, I would like to know that there is a significant ongoing multinational cooperation in several areas in the back end of nuclear fuel cycle. Indeed, cooperation between waste management organizations and researchers in different countries is well established, but mostly limited to the area of research and development. There has been very limited cooperation on implementing radioactive waste disposal. The most adoption for, for let's say, the, in this part, the adoption of dual track approach by several countries is perhaps the most notable contribution to such cooperation. The, the Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group of IFNET hopes to continue to provide an open forum and support such discussion uh, and development of cooperation that supports that supports the multinational repository concept development, not only on expert level, but also on political levels in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. Um, like I said, let's move on now to uh, the three best, uh, 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 my colleagues in the uh, back end strategies expert group. We wanted to elaborate a bit on some of the key findings that we just don't have time uh, to get into uh, in detail in that uh, 20 minute talk of mine. And so um, each will have a, uh, uh, have a few brief remarks on, on certain aspects of the report. So thank you, Cecile, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Ben. Um, so in addition to uh, your very comprehensive uh, presentation of the best um, documents, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give additional consideration on the um, design and implementation of flexible and sustainable backend solution. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So although we uh, identify three um, main uh, fuel cycle options, one thing which is important to consider is that then those options are not exclusive to the uh, to each other. Uh, if we look at the the French um, strategy, the French backend strategy, we uh, we have defined uh, a strategy to uh, which promotes circular economy and uh, uh, 
uh, towards the closure of the fuel cycle and uh, its implementation. It's uh, um, written in uh, three stages with incremental uh, development. Um, at the center of the strategy is the um, um, Orano um, recycling platform uh, with La Hague and Melox facilities, which is the, um, the strategic assets where recycling, reprocessing and recycling uh, technologies have been industry industrialized for over 40 years. And uh, they will continue to operate uh, till 2040 uh, with mono recycling strategy, but will also be the enabler to move to more advanced fuel cycle. On top of that, uh, the undertaken R&D program in France will focus uh, in the midterm on uh, multi-recycling of plutonium in uh, um, PWR fleet. And this will prepare the potential uh, industrial development of uh, the fleet of uh, fast neutron reactors, which will allow to close the, uh, the fuel cycle uh, in the second half of the 21st centuries. So beyond the, uh, the, the, the French case, I mean, uh, addition, the general considerations uh, uh, to uh, um, consider are that uh, continuous in innovations from the industry, uh, both on fuel cycle and waste management services will contribute to uh, enhance public support uh, to a nuclear technology. Um, importance also to continue their R&D effort uh, with three main objectives, uh, enhance safety, reduce environmental impacts, but also minimize waste burden and uh, improve the uh, resource use efficiency. And beyond the collaboration R&D program, uh, the facilitating of shared infrastructure, with, which was uh, already mentioned, uh, should not only focus on uh, potential mutualized uh, repositories, uh, we also should uh, consider uh, shared infrastructure on reprocessing recycling, and we could start with existing assets, not forgetting also the uh, R&D centers, which are at the um, which are um, important in the development of the. Um, advanced nuclear fuel cycle technologies. If you move to the next slide, please. Now, when uh, designing a flexible and sustainable backend solution, um, a wide system has to be considered. Um, so starting from the uh, energy system with the uh, uh, energy policy and uh, the installed and future um, reactor capacity and the willingness to uh, uh, develop advanced uh, nuclear, nuclear plants. Fuel cycle options uh, will uh, probably require some uh, uh, spent fuel management scenarios analysis and considering the value of recycling, taking into account the um, existing infrastructures as well as knowledge and competencies uh, the front-end fuel cycle impact, and more specifically, the uh, natural uranium um, considerations, and uh, as well as the value of more advanced fuel cycle. Um, all fuel cycle will uh, generate waste, which will need to uh, be disposed in a geological disposal facility. So um, waste classification and uh, waste standard standardization uh, will, will be also important, as well as development of treatment and conditioning options. This will uh, allow to uh, probably uh, assess um, <coughs> cost risk management uh, uh, to optimize the uh, geological fa facility. Spent fuel management is a very long-term uh, undertake, uh, undertakement, uh, which will last for over 100 years, and uh, will, which in, will involve multiple decisions around this time frame. There is no uh, fixed scenario, 
alternative will arise, whether the, uh, they come from um, option which will um, be available depending on market condition and technology development, or whether they are driven by social political consideration. And having flexibility in the back end uh, uh, option uh, will probably uh, lead to um, mitigate known and non risk and uncertainties. The overall um, development of an optimal program for the back end uh, of the fuel cycle will uh, probably require um, assessment methodology uh, and integrating cost risks, time options, and uh, those will um, probably um, <clears throat> allow to match the um, uncertain social political environment from the different stakeholders involved, uh, minimize the, deploy the deployment costs and mitigate risk through phase development and uh, allow to value flexibility, value also long-term objective in short-term decision and consider uh, sharing infrastructure, uh, which most probably will be uh, benefiting countries with smaller or medium nuclear capacity. With this, uh, this and uh, my, uh, uh, my speech. Thank you. Well, uh, we will return back to the, um, to the panel discussion now. We have um, Sophie Pedou from, uh, from Belgium. Uh, who has a few remarks on uh, on on her the um, some of the key findings of the of the back end strategies report, Sophie? Here I am. I'm I'm coming. Um, I have to put this in presentation. Here, everyone sees the screen. Yes. So as you introduced me, my name is Sophie Padou. Um, I have the pleasure to speak today on behalf of the, um, the panel discussion. Um, I have a PhD in science in uh, nuclear physics. Um, I modelized spallation reactions a long time ago. Since then, I've been working for the Ministry of Energy in Belgium. Uh, in the nuclear applications division. So uh, this division is um, foreseeing uh, everything nuclear in Belgium. So we are as well working uh, on the legal framework as in uh, supervising the management of the waste and uh, the interactions between the different um, um, stakeholders in the sector. My presentation today is a focus on one of the recommendations, uh, the recommendation 5.5, which is that all countries need to invest in knowledge management. And I will do this highlight uh, by giving you an example on how Belgium um, tried to uh, respond to this concern and this re recommendation. So first I will introduce the Belgian context um, as was said before by Mr. Makawi, um, Belgium has a small nuclear program with seven pressurized water reactors. And uh, Belgium is actually phasing out of nuclear power and uh, it is foreseen to, to phase out in the years to come. Originally, Belgium was in a mono recycle fuel cycle. So for, at first, when we started our nuclear program, we were recycling our spent fuel in France. But since 1993, uh, the recycling contracts were suspended by a decision of the government and uh, no new contract has been signed. So in practice, we are in, uh, effectively, we are in an open cycle since 1993, with the specificity that we have both waste, we have high level waste, and we, have, we will have spent fuel uh, to manage in the long term. Concerning the long term management of the waste, our radioactive waste management organization, Nira Sondraf, has uh, performed last year a public consultation 
concerning the strategic environmental assessment regarding the geological disposal of spent nuclear fuel, high level waste and medium level waste on the Belgian territory. Um, this was in the context of a proposal that should be translated in an official policy, but this is still a work in progress. Parallelly, in parallel of these events, Belgium, the Belgian government has decided in 2018 to support and to provide um, funds to start the MIRA research infrastructure. So for those who, of you who haven't yet heard of MIRA, uh, MIRA stands for Multipurpose Hybrid Research Reactor for High-Tech Applications. And uh, it shall be the first large-scale accelerator-driven system. MIRA um, will, also be, uh, will also be serving as the world's first major prototype reactor that should produce significant insight into the transmutation of mineral actinides. So usually transmutation of mineral actinides is linked to the multi-recycle uh, nuclear uh, fuel cycle, but we will still give support to this infrastructure even though we are phasing out of nuclear power. So this could be startling for some people, but the reason is the following, the rationale is the following. We are phasing out in the years to come, let's say 2025. When we phase out, we still have to manage the radioactive waste in the long term. And according to our current estimation, we should dispose of the nuclear spent fuel in a geological disposal facility in 2110. So this means that in between, we have three to four generations of workers that should still work to solve all the problem and manage the waste in a context where first we are dismantling our nuclear power plants and then in a context where we haven't any nuclear power plants left. So the concern was that in this context we could have less vocations or people not interested in working in the nuclear sector and by supporting the MIRA project the government hopes that this will generate enough um, incentive for new generations of engineers and new generations of workers in the nuclear sector. So there is a double purpose here that, of course, we will do research. We hope to have results, very interesting results. But also, in the perspective of the government, this is also a way to keep the um, to keep the interest in the nuclear se sector, to keep the knowledge alive and to uh, motivate new generations of worker. And the cherry of the cake would be that Mira gives such good results that it could lead to waste minimization, which is a door that is not closed yet in Belgium concerning the disposal facility. This is defended by our government in the Energy Climate National Plan. In these terms, Belgium considers it a priority to maintain its knowledge and expertise in the nuclear field, and in particular, in the responsible management of radioactive waste and spent fuel in order to guarantee in a gradual manner, a high level of safety in their long-term management and to avoid leaving undue burdens to future generations. And this is the answer Belgium gave to this concern and this recommendation that you can find in the uh, report strategies and considerations for the back end of the fuel cycle. And in the report, it is written in these terms, without investing in knowledge management, countries risk eliminating options in the future due to deteriorating research and development infrastructures or due to the loss of technology through attrition in the technical ranks. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, last, we have uh, Brent Dixon from Idaho National Laboratory in the U.S. Uh, with with a few uh, a few remarks again, elaborating on um, some of the findings we had from the um, uh, back end strategies uh, expert group. Good afternoon. My name is Brent Dixon. I'm the Deputy National Technical Director for Systems Analysis of the Nuclear Fuel Cycle for the Department of Energy in the United States. 
I'm going to be focusing my remarks on the opportunities to improve resource utilization and waste characteristics. Uh, these are the two areas that have the most room for improvement based, uh, technical improvement based on uh, different fuel cycles. I'm going to discuss the general differences in the fuel cycles without getting too technical. Next slide, please. The fuel for all nuclear reactors is based on mining uranium. Uh, when reserves are limited, prices rise and more exploration finds more reserves. Currently identified uranium reserves are sufficient for the next 130 years, which is relatively long for mined minerals and prices are currently low. Uh, nuclear energy is based on splitting of fissile atoms. The open cycle uses fissile atoms in uranium obtained by mining. Less than 1% of the natural uranium is fissile, the rest is fertile. The fissile material is concentrated to make the reactor fuel. Mono recycle focuses on recovering and concentrating the small remaining fissile material in the spent fuel to make up to 25% additional fuel. Some fissile uranium is left and a little fissile plutonium is produced in the reactor and that's what's used to uh, make the additional fuel. Only one recycle is practical. In multi-recycle, a different strategy is used and it focuses on the conversion of large quantities of otherwise waste fertile material and converting those into useful fissile material uh, via fast reactors. By making as much or more fissile than is consumed, additional recycle fuel can be made indefinitely. Next slide, please. The waste characteristics are related to the fuel cycle strategy. Open cycle waste includes the fertile uranium, the smaller atoms from the fissioned uranium called fission products, and some plutonium and other heavier elements created in the reactor called transuranics. Mono recycle removes most of the uranium from the first uh, cycle, the open cycle, which reduces the amount of uranium in high level waste. The extra uranium is disposed as low level waste or depleted uranium. Multi recycle consumes the uranium and the plutonium, keeping them out of the waste stream entirely, except for trace amounts uh, from uh, incomplete separation. And there's an option where the additional um, transuranics called minor actinides can also be recycled, keeping them also out of the waste stream. Uh, next slide, please. The main hazards in the waste are radiotoxicity and uh, to design a repository, decay heat is a major consideration. Radiotoxicity and decay heat and high level waste are due to radioactive isotopes in the waste material. Initially, these are primarily the fission products, but most of those decay away within a few years with only a few lasting much longer. Most transuranics last much longer, but not as long as uranium and uranium and transuranics are the main sources for long-term radiotoxicity. The long-term radiotoxicity can be reduced by a factor of as much as a thousand times by removing uranium and plut plutonium from the waste stream and instead consuming them uh, through multi-recycle. Uh, the decay heat is also reduced by removing some of these uh, different materials and that's shown in the chart on the lower right. So in summary, the more you recycle, the more you reduce or even eliminate uranium mining, and the more you reduce waste volumes and hazards. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Thanks for elaborating on that for us. Uh, that concludes the uh, uh, brief opening remarks for the panel discussion. And now we have, um, we have time for uh, answering um, questions uh, and, and, and comments We've gotten quite a few already. I've been through uh, most of them. So let me get started with, uh, with that. Um, we're not going to be able to answer all of your questions here in, this, uh, in the webinar in the next uh, um, 15 minutes or so. But um, we will, uh, I understand we will have answers. Uh, we will have answers developed and, and provided to you through the, uh, the website. Um, so let me get started with a few. Um, so, so there were a few questions on cost and financing and then SMRs. Now, I wanted to kind of uh, group those together because 
I haven't discussed follow-on activities from this report that the NEA has planned for the uh, next program of work for 2021-2022. And there are, um, some of them are going to be addressing cost financing and SMRs. Um, first, we have a, um, we have plans for systems, uh, systems analysis and cost benefit analysis of closing the fuel cycle uh, that will be undertaken by, uh, ten, uh, I believe this will be a joint effort with the division of the, uh, the Nuclear Development Committee and, and the Radioactive Waste Management Committee. Um, and so this will, this will get into a, a much more detail on, on the systems analyses and cost benefits for the um, back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, and another area in the Nuclear Development Committee that we'll be taking on is looking at both the front end and back end, eva uh, evaluating the front end and back end requirements for, uh, uh, for small modular reactors. Many, many of the small modular reactors are uh, advanced, relying on advanced reactors with advanced fuel, uh, fuel types and the reactors are under development, but the um, uh, we want to ensure that all of the the fuel cycle uh, considerations are uh, are looked at and evaluated as well. And that is something that will be a follow-on activity. Uh, another follow-on activity is in the science division. Uh, on uh, they have an effort on partitioning and transmutation. So this goes to one of our recommendations about. Uh, really having uh, about having international collaborations on these advanced technologies, and that's on. Uh, there's a uh, there's a group in the science division who's who's pulled together a team of experts to evaluate partitioning and transmutation. One other thing about cost, and I wanted to throw this one over to Brent, who was just presenting. But um, with respect to our report our analysis could you could you talk about what what the uh we saw were the uh uh considerations regarding cost across the fuel cycle options sure um there isn't very much difference in cost between the different fuel cycles the main cost in uh to produce electricity with nuclear power is the cost of the reactors and every fuel cycle requires reactors uh, mainly what you see is open cycle. The main costs are up front with the uranium mining and concentrating the fissile material. Whereas as you move to more recycle, the costs shift to the back end uh, where it's the cost of recycling the, the fuel. Um, the differences are, are fairly minor in the fuel cycle themselves. There is greater uncertainty with multi-recycle because that's never been implemented on a commercial scale whereas open cycle and mono recycle have been implemented with the exception of the disposal portion of the fuel cycle. So the uncertainty for those fuel cycles as far as costs is, is less. Thank you, Brett. We had another series of questions regarding proliferation and safeguards. So, um, and, and, and how they're, um, um, how we arrived at our, our consideration that these are, um, these are risks that are, that are uh, uh, addressed in, in all the fuel cycle options and, and not real discriminators. Um, so first of all, proliferation is in a category by itself uh, and uh, we have safeguards separated out in in the um, uh, the, uh, the characteristic we call security. As far as proliferation goes, you've got two risks there. You've got the um, you've got the enrichment of the uranium in the front end, uh, and you've got reprocessing in the back end for the uh, fuel cycle options that use reprocessing. And so in the uh, Open cycle, you have you have to enrich the uranium for the light water reactors. In the um, in the closed fuel cycle, you uh, you need you you don't need enrichment uh, once you get going. Once you get that that process working, and so 
all fuel cycle, basically all fuel cycle options have proliferation risks that are managed through uh, existing mechanisms that we have in place for, um, for the uh, um, uh, enrichment and reprocessing industries. Um, now, as far as safeguards go, um, we had that, uh, we had a talk, a, a good talk uh, earlier about safeguards for, for the repositories. And, 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 and so you can see that there are considerations across the board in all fuel cycle options, we have to safeguard the material uh, as you, uh, all, as, all the way through, as you move through the, uh, the fuel cycle from front end to reactors, to storage, to back end. So again, not, not a discriminator really where you can point to one or the other fuel cycles as having something that is uniquely different to it regarding either proliferation or, or safeguards. Um, there's another question. I hope I can throw this over to Sophie. Um, sorry to uh, hit you up on this, but I think you might be able to uh, uh, address questions we had on why, why uh, separate out minor actinides? Does it really make a difference in, um, in the back end? Do you think, can, can you take that one, Sophie? Uh, yes, but I have to check the, what do you mean exactly by what difference does it make to, because there are several um, minor actinides um, I know that uh, americium is a heater, for example, and so because of the heat emitted, it is um, it is an isotope that puts a lot of constraints in the geological disposal facility. So having this um, americium separated and eventually burned, incinerated, or re recycled could uh, liberate some constraints on the geological disposal facility, but I don't know if this is the kind of answers you are searching for this question. I'm going back now looking for that particular question. I, um... the, the purpose in the multi-recycling is that by burning at each step, the minor actinides, you reduce the constraints on your uh, disposal facility by uh, reducing the heat, for example, with the americium, but you also reduce the time scale needed uh, because you are eliminating the isotopes that have the longer um, time spans, uh, uh, half-lives. Okay, I, I found the question, Sophie, so I can read it, read it to you uh, as written. How do you quantify the benefit of separating and transmuting actinides? If all cycles require a repository, you can simply throw the actinides away in the multi-recycle repository and save lots of money. So, yeah, um, there is also a social acceptance part in this, which is hard to put a price tag on. Um, because of the time scales are so different, whether you have minor actinides or not, the fact that you are separating them or the fact that you are putting them in the disposal facility makes, um, has uh, as a consequence that your geological disposal facility should ensure safety and security for hundreds of thousands of years. If you take them out, then the studies are showing that you could reduce this um, need to ensure safety. Uh, well, may maybe those are not the correct words, but you understand, I think, what I mean, that you are reducing the constraints because of the radiotoxicity to a few hundred years if you manage to eliminate all the minor actinides in the multi-recycling. Of course, this means that you will have to separate them and put them in new fuels and then send them in reactors adapted to burning them. So these, these are very different um, cycles, but the public per perception can 
play a role here in the political uh, decisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really, I'm, I'm going through the, um, uh, let's see. Those were the main ones that jumped out at me. I don't know if, um, Hiroyuki, you've been going through these yourself, and if you have any that you'd like to throw out my way to, to answer now, I think we have a few more minutes that we can, we can, we can do that. Okay. Yes, I think it can be interesting for today's uh, discussion. It is from Mr. Uh, Gard. So the question is, can there be cases where spent nuclear fuel is reprocessed and conditioned, meaning safeguards are terminated on the materials before being disposed of underground? If so, would there still be safeguards reporting related, related to the additional protocol at high level waste uh, repositories? How about this? Well, I think um, I, would, I would like to um, throw that one over to uh, Jeremy Whitlock, if I could. Jeremy, are you still there? Could you, can you yeah. uh, address that? Yeah, certainly, and I and I wrote an answer to that in the in the in the answer section. So it's in in general, I would not expect that you could you could condition uh, the the waste to a point where it would meet the requirements for termination of safeguards. But in general, for spent nuclear uh, uh, fuel or in special nuclear nu nuclear fuel, but in general, yes, terminated nuclear safeguards that that is terminated on nuclear material, you would be able to. Uh, use additional protocol measures to to uh, verify. Um, here's a, another, let's say, follow-up question to Jeremy. So if you take these three best scenarios, open, partially, multi-recycling, do you see an option that multi-recycle would disposal of waste from multi-recycle without minor actinides, without plutonium, they would be safeguards free? Okay, so I'm not going to commit, but uh, it would depend on the concentration of the material. So if you are, it is it is possible in in theory to get material down to a concentration where we would consider termination, but it would be a case by case basis. Uh, it would ha it's a very low it's a very low threshold that we have for termination of safeguards I mean, because we are we are essentially taking our eyes off the material forever. Yeah. I mean. Uh I'm, I'm talking now hypothetically because we know that all those, at least multi-recycling uh, scenario is far from technologically mature. So I know we don't have uh, numbers here that would fit for you even close to that. But my question was, do you see a potential for any of those three scenarios to de develop into the direction that you would need a repository without a safeguard? Uh, certainly a potential. It's, it's worth discussing. It's it's a, an interesting direction to be to be discussing. As I outlined in my presentation, there are a lot of challenges. So any time you have that level of challenges over that long a period of time, we are certainly open to creative solutions as well. But definitely a case by by case basis. And I would stress that there is a a, a very high bar to to reach before we terminate safeguards. We don't. It's not something we we, we do lightly. Bill, do you mind if I jump into this a bit? Because I think this is a very important uh, question to analyze. And it really is consistent with the presentation you saw from both Brent and Sophie. Um, if you have a technology that has the ability to uh, burn minor actinides um, to a very, very low level, and I think Sophie mentioned perhaps get to the place where the, um, the safety case only requires you to monitor for 300 years or 500 years instead of a instead of 100,000 years, and, and, which is a little optimistic. I don't think we quite get to that. But if you get into that kind of technology, um, you, 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 are out of, you are almost by definition out of the safeguards discussion because you're no longer carrying these uh, transuranics, which is what the safeguards are really designed to uh, protect. So the technology would have to be successful. And there certainly has been a lot of research done, particularly with accelerator-driven systems, but also with fast reactors. Um, to enable 
uh, targets to be made um, that can be exposed to high energy neutrons and to have those minor actinides destroyed or transmuted. Um, this is this is the dream. You know, this is this is what the research is about. And um, if that's successful, it, it is a very very different future. Um, I, I will stress, however, I think it's very important that you'll there almost is all in every case you have to dispose of something. Uh, but maybe, um, and this is somewhat um, elaborating what Sophie said a little while ago, maybe what you dispose of is not high level waste as we currently think about it. And therefore the requirements of the disposal facility are entirely different. And that's, that's the dream. And we are not there today, but that is certainly where the research would like to go. And in addition to that, I would, I would um... What you say is absolutely true. I would just also point out that depleted uranium is a is a material that we safeguard as well. And you're going to be full of that. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we're we're coming to uh, we're coming to the end. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank you all for your questions, and uh, we will be addressing all of them in writing after the, at some point after the webinar. Um, I would like to, uh, I would like to turn the floor back over to uh, Director General Magwood for some, uh, for his closing remarks. Um, th thank you, Bill. And I'll keep this very brief since we are about out of time. First, let me thank all the speakers. I, I think that there were some very um, relevant and interesting presentations. I, I really encourage um, everyone who's interested in the subject to look at the report very closely. Um, it is very comprehensive and it will give a very good overview of what the options are and what the, the, the various aspects of those options are. Um, as Bill has already highlighted, there's going to be more work at the NEA done on this. Uh, in particular, the Nuclear Development Committee will be working uh, on an expert group on the economics of extended storage and spent fuel, for example. Uh, we'll be looking more at the economics of the different options that were discussed in the BEST report. And we're very excited um, about a joint um, nuclear science, nuclear development um, task group looking at advanced cycles, including partitioning and transmutation. Um, and this is a subject which has certainly waxed and waned over the last uh, few decades, uh, but it's coming back because people are interested in achieving what Sophie had talked about, those very, very um, ag aggressive um, targets for reducing the toxicity in each heat generation of, of nuclear waste. And that's what partitioning transmutation is all about. So this expert group will be looking very closely at that subject and will ask the question, you know, what do we need to do today to get ready for that to happen by 2050? What research is necessary? What facilities are necessary? So this is very exciting. Um, so I will, I will conclude just by, again, thanking Bill in particular for uh, his chairmanship of this group and for, for leading the discussion today, uh, to all the speakers who contributed, to all the people who contributed to the report, um, to the, uh, the team at Nuclear Technology um, and NEA led by Gloria Kwong, uh, who worked on this, and Hiroki, who, um, who was a staff person run, running the study. Um, thank all of you and um, enjoy the report and we look forward to the next steps. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. So thank you, Mr. Magut, and thank you all panelists, speakers, and all of the over 200 participants around the world for really interesting and dynamic discussion for today's webinar. So I also thank you for your kind tolerance to the inconvenience due to the technical difficulties during the webinar. Before leaving connection, please note that the NEA report strategies and considerations for the back end of the fuel cycle is now available on NEA website. And Yes, uh, replies to unanswered questions, as well as presentations and recording of this webinar will be available on IFNEC and NEA websites in the following days. So, well, now we close the webinar. So thank you for everyone and goodbye. <laughs>